Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about stickleback evolution. Charles Darwin's idea of natural selection has pretty much remained unchanged until this day. Unfortunately, he didn't do a lot of experimentation on natural selection back then, and they really didn't know that you could observe it in nature, and we really have done a ton of that in the last hundred years. And so if we look right here, this is the story of the peppered moth, remember, and how that evolves, or the work of Peter and Rosemary Grant on the finches of the Galapagos, they studied it for decades, or the work on guppies in Trinidad. So there's a lot of data out there of, of organisms evolving over time, but in this one I'm going to talk about uh, evolution in the stickleback, which is an unlikely kind of hero, this unlikely fish. And the ones I'm going to talk about are found in Alaska. Um, as I talk about evolution, I really want you to understand that evolution is pretty much the same throughout all of nature. We sometimes delineate between microevolution and macroevolution, where microevolution is change in the gene pool, and we'll see that in the stickleback. And then uh, macroevolution is speciation, or the formation of two species from one. Most scientists would say that there's really no difference between the two. All we're doing is it's organisms that are adapting to their local environment. And we can see both of these at play in the stickleback. So let me tell you the story of the comeback stickleback. If you're interested in this, here's a little web link, and I'll put that down in the video description as well, so you can look at the research um, that was done on these stickleback fish. And so basically, the story starts back in the, in the 80s. And so we had a group of stickleback. These are freshwater stickleback. Um, they're perfectly adapted to this environment in Loberg Lake, which is not a big lake right outside of Wasilla, Alaska. And, and basically, they were having a great time. And then in 1982, uh, the lake was poisoned. And it was poisoned to get rid of all fish so they could reintroduce some trout into the area. And so all these perfectly evolved sticklebacks died. And so it was an empty lake. Uh, but a few years later, anadromous sticklebacks, and that's a huge word, I'm happy I said it right, that basically means they swam their way back from the ocean, made it into Loberg Lake, and they started reproducing. Now, the, the, the difference between the two, hopefully you saw, is that these ones are going to have bigger spikes, these marine sticklebacks, or ones that are found in the ocean, and they have all these armored plates on the side. In fact, we call them fully armored stickleback on the side. And the reason that they look that way is that these are the main predators of them when they're out in the ocean. It's going to be trout, it's going to be salmon, things like that. And so these aren't here anymore in this Loberg Lake. And so they started reproducing and their numbers started to increase to the point where scientists started to note them. Now, once you make it to the lake, obviously there's going to be a predator here as well. And so this is the dragonfly larva. And the dragonfly larva loves to uh, grab onto sticklebacks and then eat them. And so the sticklebacks that used to be in the lake had kind of an evolved defense to this. The old sticklebacks grow really, really fast, and so they don't spend a lot of time being small enough that they can actually be preyed upon by this dragonfly. And also, all these spikes in the plates are a disadvantage because it makes it easier to grab onto that stickleback. And so basically what happens is um, we have growth of the stickleback. They start to do well, but we also have these dragonflies that are doing well just eating them. And so this is when the scientists show up, and I'll show you data in just a second. So 1990, almost all of the stickleback are going to be of this fully armored, anadromous, made it from the ocean kind of a class. And so over time, what the scientists start to observe is that the number of those that are fully armored starts to decrease, and the number of those uh, that are not fully armored start to increase, or the low armored sticklebacks start to increase. Until today, we have all of those sticklebacks looking like the ones that were probably originally there before the poisoning. And so this is the researchers. So this is from Bell Lab, and this is Michael Bell. I had a little brief email exchange with him, and he said, feel free to use any of the data. Um, he thinks this is a great example of natural selection. He thought it was important that we share this with students around the world. And so thank you, Michael, for sharing that with me. And thank you for everybody else who collected the data so that we can see it. And so basically, this is a summary of their data. So in 1990, they show up. And there's not hardly any of these low-armored sticklebacks. But as they start observing it over the next 20 years, we see an increase in the low-armored sticklebacks. And then we see a decrease in the fully-armored stickleback. And there's really one gene that's determining if the number of plates that we have on, on each of the different fish. Now, lots of times we see data represented like that, but we really miss what's going on. And so let's kind of dig our way into the data that they collected. This is some example. So basically what they were doing in this 
these researchers were grabbing the sticklebacks, all the one, every summer they'd go to the lake, they'd catch as many sticklebacks as they could, they'd dye them, so they don't really look this red color, but they dye them so they could see the plates on the side. And then they would basically take one fish and they'd count the number of plates on the side. So they're starting up at the top, they count the total number of plates, and then they would simply graph that. And so in 1990, most of them are going to have around 33 plates on the side. And there's some that have a little bit less and some that have a little bit more. So we have variation. We have this bell-shaped curve. And then they simply go back year after year after year. So let's look what happens in 1991. We start to see a few of these low armored show up. They only have seven plates. They only have these plates up towards the front. If we keep going, what we see, so now we're, you know, four years, five years later, we're starting to, to see what's called directional selection. So those dragonflies are targeting the ones that have fully armored, and we're starting to see an increase in the low armor. And we call this microevolution. We're changing the gene pool, and if we ever change the frequency in the gene pool, evolution occurs. And so let's what hap watch what happens over the next, from 1998 to 1999, and, and they keep collecting this data all the way until the year 2008. And so we see directional selection. So we're moving towards a bell-shaped curve that has less of these um, armored plates. And so we still have variation, and we still have a few of these fully armored left in 2009, but we've seen microevolution. We've seen change from this fully armored, slow-growing, um, marine-like fish to the one that looks a lot like the fish that were there before they were actually poisoned. So we see evolution taking place. I think this is a great example of microevolution or change in the gene pool. And it really didn't take that long. We like to think of evolution must take millions or thousands of years to occur. This took, you know, less than a lifetime. It took two decades to observe a complete change in the phenotypes of these fish. So that's neat. And when I asked Mike to um, if we could use the data, he sent me some more data, data that they've collected since then. So this is published in 2012, and I think this is really cool. So basically in this study what they did is they wanted to see if speciation is occurring. And so this is a phylogenetic tree. So basically how do you read a phylogenetic tree? Time is going to go from the left to the right, and every time we have a branch point, that means that there was a common ancestor here, and then we have a line, a different lineage that comes from that. And so what they were looking at in this study were these Loberg sticklebacks. They then found some sticklebacks in Rabbit Slough, which is just a few kilometers away. And they thought this is a good representation of what this first group of uh, sticklebacks that made their way into the lake look like. You can see that it looks a lot more like a marine type of uh, stickleback. And then they found some sticklebacks from Corcoran Lake, which is 40 miles away. And so these were probably shared ancestry with Loberg Lake and those of Rabbit Slough, but it's a really long time ago. And so how do we know who's related to whom? We can just do genetic analysis of all of these fish, and we can see who's related to who based on the DNA and how the DNA has changed over time. And so what they wanted to see is if there were starting to be reproductive isolation. And so basically what they would do is put these males in a tank and see how many of the females would mate with them. And surprisingly, even though it was probably 20 years since they diverged as a species, the females in the Loberg Lake were ignoring those in Rabbit Slough. And the researchers think that had to do with just their physical appearance, the way they looked, and they were larger and different in shape. They weren't willing to mate with them. However, they were willing to mate with those that they diverged from a long time ago. And so what they'd shown is that not only had the sticklebacks changed, but now they were not reproducing with each other. And so basically, what does that mean? Well, the, the point at which they fail to mate with each other we've now created two species. So we've gone from one to two. And so that's a pretty amazing data. And so the stories of the stickle pack continue to amaze us and, and impress scientists as well. And so, um, so thanks for the data and thanks for watching. I hope that's helpful.